All right, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lourdes Castro Ramirez, and I serve as the Secretary of California's Business, Consumer Services, and Housing Agency. I also am the Chair of the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council. I want to welcome the council members, uh, the staff, and those of you that are joining us um, for today's meeting. We're meeting uh, today just uh, about a month from, um, just over a month um, from our special um, council meeting in September, where we had uh, the opportunity to uh, discuss the progress of the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council Action Plan. And I'm very um, excited and pleased you know, to share that a lot of good progress has been made. And today the council will have an opportunity to vote on the uh, action plan objectives. Before uh, we begin with roll call, I do want to acknowledge something that many of you are likely aware of, um, something that occurred last week with the release of the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness um, with the release of the strategic plan. Um, well, you know, the, the plan that USICH released um, has some good uh, components and sensible suggestions including uh, more focus on mental health services and also moving away from a focus on uh, using law enforcement to address homelessness. It uh, really completely misses the mark in terms of their understanding of the housing first model. Um, it you know, mischaracterizes what housing first approaches truly are and what they're not. Um, and it also, um, you know, uses data to prove uh, that housing, I would say, you know, it uses flawed data um, to, to prove that housing first uh, doesn't work. And so I, you know, felt very strongly that it was important um, to share that perspective uh, because I think as council members, you all know that uh, housing first is the approach um, that uh, guides much of it. <laughs> it is uh, at the core of this council's mission, and uh, we have much data and many um, efforts uh, that demonstrate that this approach uh, does not only prevent and end homelessness, but it leads to su successful outcomes for people experiencing homelessness. Uh, so, you know. To that end, um, you know, later today during the, the council meeting, we'll have the opportunity to hear from some of our council members and uh, to hear about the shared support and the shared efforts that are underway uh, that uh, demonstrate uh, the commitment from the governor's office, from the entire administration on um, how we're continuing to respond to the multiple crises uh, impacting people experiencing homelessness and how we're continuing to um, expand uh, permanent housing um, opportunities for, uh, for individuals and families. So with that, uh, the Homeless Coordinating and Financing Council meeting is hereby uh, called call to order. Uh, today is October the 26th and uh, it is, uh, 1 10 p.m. and so I will ask uh, Nicole Saragosa Smith, uh, who's a member of our staff, uh, to please call the roll. Nicole, are you on the line? And do you have the list no. in front of you? And if not, uh, give us one second. We're going to ask um, Evan to help us um, with roll call here. Yeah, come on, please. Oh, All right, so uh, roll call. Um, Council Chair uh, Lourdes Castro Ramirez. Here. Council Vice Chair Emilio Ramirez. Thank you, Simon. Emilio? He's waving. Okay. <laughs> Council Member Amy Anderson. Present. 
Uh, Council Member Russell Atterbury. Here. Uh, Council Member Alexis Berries. No. Present. Council Member Gina Bucchieri Harrington. Present. Council Member Corinne Buchanan. Present. Council Member Donald Kevier. Present. Council Member JC Cooper. Present. Council Member Gail Gilman. Present. Council Member Jody Ketchisar. Present. Council Member Jennifer Loving. Present. Council Member Gary McCoy. Present. Council Member Tokes Omashakin. Present. Council Member Joe Ukashiba. No response. Council Member Gustavo Velasquez. Here. Thank you. The roll call is complete. We have quorum, Evan. We do, yes. Okay. So we have quorum and we can uh, begin the meeting. Uh, again, just want to uh, extend a warm uh, welcome to those of you who are tuning in online or by telephone uh, to this meeting of the council. Uh, during our uh, special meeting in September, I had an opportunity to highlight uh, the efforts of the council, including uh, an overview of a guidance document that we issued uh, that helps uh, local communities uh, understand the funding that's available and how to prioritize and leverage those um, funds um, to continue uh, to respond to the extraordinary health and economic circumstances um, that uh, individuals and families are facing uh, given this you know, COVID-19 pandemic. We will continue um, to encourage um, people to access um, the uh, constantly growing uh, number of resources that are being made available both through our agency, through HCFC, um, but also through many of you that are on the council. I know you're also doing your part um, to share information uh, with locals in terms of the resources that are available um, to ensure that we're protecting the, the public health and safety of um, some of the most vulnerable um, individuals in our communities. Um, in addition to the um, development of these critical resources, uh, in November, uh, next month, uh, next week, in fact, <laughs> uh, HCFC um, will be releasing uh, round two of the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Funding. Uh, this is also known as HAP, uh, HAP round two funding. Uh, which uh, will be made available to the 44 um, COCs, Continuums of Care, uh, also to the 13 uh, large cities within our state and 58 counties. Uh, this funding uh, complements um, the funding that uh, Governor Newsom announced just last week. Uh, he announced an additional $200 million um, in support of Home Key. And uh, again, you know, these you know, funds are being made available to encourage and support uh, your jurisdictions, local jurisdictions, to continue to move urgently and deliber deliberately uh, in preventing re and reducing homelessness in uh, our communities. Uh, we also continue to make uh, much progress uh, with regard to bringing the homeless data integration system uh, acronym is HDIS. Uh, we use a lot of acronyms here. <laughs> um, this you know, system uh, will be coming online next year um, in the first quarter of 2021. And uh, we're very uh, excited because a lot of you know, good progress has been made. Um, HCFC and the course of the next um, you know, a few weeks and leading up to the um, that, that sort of go live in the first quarter of 2021, we'll be coordinating with all 44 continuums of care uh, to transfer data from their systems, from their HMIA systems into the state um, warehouse, um, which is you know, the, what we now know as the, the HDIS system. 
uh, we are, you know, uh, very much looking to building this uh, shared uh, data system and creating a culture that enables us to be able to better understand um, the uh, services, um, how dollars are being used, um, and you know, really utilize this data to inform our um, understanding, to um, inform our policy making, and to inform our continued you know, efforts to prevent, reduce, and end homelessness. Uh, Ali will have an opportunity during her report out to give a few more details, uh, but we are making you know, tremendous progress and uh, very much you know, looking forward to um, our go live um, in the first quarter of uh, 2021. Today, as I mentioned during my opening remarks, uh, we will be um, voting on the HCFC action plan, um, more specifically, the objectives uh, or the framework that has been uh, developed with input from all of our council members, um, along with uh, a number of uh, key experts, uh, practitioners, providers, persons with lived experience, um, you know, just want to take a moment to um, acknowledge and thank all of you um, who were part of this process, uh, helping us shape the framework, helping us identify the objectives, helping us also to prioritize uh, what we will be presenting today. Um, and, you know, uh, today within, you know, your packets and your agenda, uh, you um, should have received um, the overview of the 15 high level objectives that will form the action plan. Uh, these objectives will be used um, to develop and guide our work over the course of the next two years. Uh, so essentially from 2021 through 2023. And you know, as uh, Governor Newsom has um, stated, um, when it comes to homelessness, no community is immune, no person is untouched. And so now more than ever, we must um, continue, and we know that we can um, continue to work together to ensure that we're investing and working together uh, to bring relief to all communities. Uh, so uh, before we, you know, move to the next item on the agenda, just a few logistics, um, particularly for those of you that are joining us uh, for today's conversation and today's meeting. So just uh, like to remind all members of the public um, that we will be uh, taking public comment before any council action. Um, and also we will have an opportunity to receive comments um, at, the, at the end um, as you know, time allows um, during the general comment um, uh, timeframe uh, or when it's agendized. Uh, to help our meeting stay on track with time, please make sure that your comments are related to the item that's on the agenda or the item that is being discussed. This will help council members, you know, be able to weigh in uh, more thoughtfully um, and to consider your input. Uh, also, um, we will allow for a maximum of three minutes for each comment to keep us on schedule. Members of the public who wish to comment on any item must be connected to the meeting through the web conference link. So please take a moment to locate the raise hand icon on your screen, as this will be used to request um, comment or to request you know, the, the, uh, the ability to provide comment. If you are connected by telephone only, you will be in listen only mode for the duration of this meeting. However, if you'd like to switch from the you know, telephone to, uh, to the web uh, conference link, uh, the information is um, available in terms of how to do that. Uh, so please refer to the public meeting agenda for directions on how to connect to the web conference. And I will pause here and ask Evan if there's anything else that we should uh, share with uh, the public. Because um, we, you know, we definitely do want to ensure that uh, those of you that have joined us that want to share your perspective or provide, you know, remarks are able to do so. Absolutely. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, I would say that anyone um, who wishes to provide public comment, uh, who's not already connected uh, through their computer uh, or through uh, the web conference, 
um, should visit our website at bcsh.ca.gov slash hcfc and find the public uh, meeting agenda for this meeting. Uh, that will have uh, specific directions about how to join this meeting. And from there, you will be able to uh, provide public comment through your computer, through your, uh, your audio connection there. Thank you. Do you want to provide the, um, the web address again? Uh, sure. So uh, the web address is bcsh.ca.gov slash hcfc. Thank you, Evan. Okay, so now turning to item number two on our agenda, action item is uh, to adopt the meeting summary from our September, September 15th, um, 2020 meeting. Uh, council members and the public um, have been provided with a draft summary. I uh, just want to ask if there are any corrections or comments on the draft that council members would like to offer. This is the time to do so. Any comments, any questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, before we proceed um, with this action item, we will now accept um, comments from the public. Do any members of the public have any comments specific to our September meeting summary? And again, if you wish to provide comment, uh, please you know, select the raise hand icon in the meeting window on your computer and we will unmute your audio to allow for comment. I'm seeing no comments, no raised hands. Looks like we have no, no comments on this item. Okay, thank you, Evan. So at this time, we have no comments from the public and we have no comments from council members. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? So moved. I'll second. Sorry. It was moved by, if you can uh, mention your name. Stop. I, I'm. Um, okay. Sure. So we have a, it's been I, moved. I, second. I, I seconded Jody catch Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So if Nicole is on uh, the line, uh, Nicole, will you um, call the roll to capture the votes from council members? And if not, we'll ask Evan to do so. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think there was some difficulty, so I, I can pull roll. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so, Council Chair Lourdes Castro Ramirez. Yes. Council Vice Chair Emilio Ramirez. Yes. Council Member Amy Anderson. Yes. Council Member Russell Atterbury. Yes. Council Member Alexis Berries. Yes. Council Member Gina Bucchieri Harrington. Yes. Council Member Corinne Buchanan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Council Member Donald Kevier. Yes. Council Member JC Cooper. Yes. Council Member Gail Gilman. Council Member Gail Gilman? Yes. Yes, thank you. Council Member Jody Ketchaside? Yes. <clears throat> Council Member Jennifer Loving? Yes. Council Member Gary McCoy? Yes. Council Member Topes Omashakin? Yes. Uh, Council Member Gustavo Velasquez? Yes. Yes. The motion is approved. Okay, motion approved. Thank you. So moving on to um, item number three of our agenda. This, this is a discussion item uh, on racial disparities among people experiencing homelessness. I uh, just want to kind of preface this by saying that, you know, we know that uh, homeless programs and 
the homeless programs uh, and systems uh, in general have a significant and direct responsibility uh, to ensure that uh, they're not uh, themselves in the process of providing services having a disparate impact on people based on their race or ethnicity. And of course, you know, the way that we know um, or are able um, to determine whether that is happening is by looking at the impact of the programs through a racial and ethnic lens. Uh, and that, you know, requires oftentimes uh, collecting data, analyzing, and then using that data and that analysis um, to, uh, to rectify and to take appropriate action. Uh, today's agenda um, item is a brief review of what we uh, currently know about the statistics describing racial disparities among people experiencing homelessness. And I'm so uh, pleased to, uh, to welcome also and to introduce um, to all of you um, our new uh, executive officer for the Homelessness uh, Coordinating and Financing Council, uh, Julie Lowe, who's uh, going to uh, facilitate and guide us through uh, today's discussion. Uh, welcome, Julie. It's uh, a pleasure to have you join the team. Uh, we're so excited. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Julie Lowe. I joined council staff as the executive officer about three weeks ago. I'm happy to be meeting many of you for the first time at this meeting and look forward to our work together. We do have a packed agenda, and so I won't go too far into introductions for now, but I'll say that as executive officer, I am responsible for four areas of HCFC's work, many of which we'll be touching upon today. Um, under the leadership of Secretary Castro Ramirez and of course, Deputy Secretary Alex Sutton, um, of course, one of my primary duties is to oversee HCFC's growing staff to execute the objectives as determined by the council. Um, in addition to that, I oversee our HDIS team, another hot topic, um, as well as support our policy and research team, and also to assure that our growing work to collaborate with and support our COCs and our local communities continues to run smoothly. So I look forward to working with all of you today. Um, I'm going to move straight into um, some brief framing to set the stage for uh, our star, our guest stars today, or our guest speakers. Um, I'm excited for our guests to present today. They bring expertise about both the underlying reasons and the evidence which suggests that we cannot meaningfully address the prevention, reduction, and end of homelessness without specifically addressing the structural issues which exasperate racial disparities. Before I turn to our speakers, I'd like to put some connective tissue between the racial and ethnic composition of Californians, Californians experiencing homelessness and the work of this council in particular to work towards a focused, coordinated, and cross-systems interagency response to homelessness. While the actual data is stark in nature, and we'll see that in just a sec, we know that there is still quite a bit of myth-busting that needs to occur that'll get us from looking at the data to what we can do around it. Next slide, please. I'll start by describing the chart. So. The chart on the screen, um, the left column is the general population of Californians that's ranked from the biggest to the smallest proportions across the state. If you are an eagle eye reader, you will see that the values sum to greater than 100%. And that is because categories are drawn from racial composition for all but the figure for the Hispanic Latino subgroup. So rest assured, we've checked the math, um, which is drawn from ethnic breakdowns. The column on the right are the 2019 point in time count estimates for the composition of persons experiencing homelessness. The red lines highlight the groups where the estimated proportion of people experiencing homelessness is greater than their statewide, um, than the statewide composition, the statewide figure, and the figures in black are the inverse, which is lower. This data tells us that Black Californians are represented by a four times multiple for people experiencing homelessness. And overall, racial and ethnic minorities make up about half of people experiencing homelessness overall. So certainly start. Next slide, please. Because of California's broader housing crisis, it is of course natural to look at the supply side of housing. So how much housing is available? 
And in many ways, housing affordability and availability of housing to Californians who are experiencing precarity, especially now during our public health and economic crisis, um, is something we look at. And we also look at that for people seeking exits from homelessness. Um, we think of that as two ways that we can address these racial gaps. Of course, economic factors will surely grow worse as our crisis continues. We see here through some of the sample data that I pulled that um, racial and ethnic minorities across the state face disproportionate economic hardships in relation to housing and, and income. However, we want to continue to create space between um, distinguishing the work of this council as prevent, preventing, decreasing, and ending homelessness from the closely linked housing crisis. We need to look at this issue more as a yes and issue and not a yes but issue, right? So it is about housing and it is about all the other things that we as a council are, are discussing um, in particular through our action plan. Next slide, please. Specifically, we look at the striking racial disparities among Black Californians compared to the state overall. Researchers, practitioners, and people who have struggled amidst these factors have brought to light that it's not just about income, but rather these significant gaps are perpetuated by and the direct result of longstanding discrimination towards people of color and specifically Black people across California in all facets of the system including criminal justice, the criminal justice system, access to quality and affordable health care, housing discrimination, such as those which carry over from redlining, and a host of other socially determined factors. This is the reason that we are eager to share some examples of research and information, um, and we're so excited to have our guests with us today. Next slide, please. One more slide. One more? Yes, please. Oh, no, 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 one back. Sorry. I didn't see that. <laughs> oh, yeah, take the moment to update. Yeah. Okay. Got ahead of myself. Oh. Let's see. Let's make sure we have. Hold on. So we sat around some meetings. Um, wanted to highlight one of the suggested must reads. And I think the slides are taking a moment to catch up. There, um, there are links available on the HCFC website. Both this reading along with the other readings, including one that we'll highlight um, in just a sec. Um, we found this particularly interesting because the relationship between homelessness, race, and the sorts of risk factors faced by Black, Indigenous, and people of color are much more multifaceted. Um, we wanted to, we invited our expert presenters who will continue to work with us um, and, and help us build our collective knowledge as we continue to grow and tackle this issue. Couple of things to highlight about the SPARC study. Um, it is, um, it was a mixed method research project that employed the use of over 111,000 HMIS records. So records about individuals, um, along with some qualitative data. And this, this study was uh, conducted across six communities, one of which is uh, San Francisco. Some of the key findings that I think is especially important for the council um, as many of the findings speak substantively to the work that we will soon discuss in our action plan, is that um, even in the study, um, looking at overrepresentation of particular um, racial and ethnic subgroups, um, they found uh, results that are concordant with what I just showed um, as our statewide um, numbers. And so that's saying um, that this racial inequity is is consistent across all many communities in the U.S. Um, second, it provides, um, and notab notably, under the Pathways into Homelessness bullet here, um, it provides factors which highlight that poverty alone does not equal homelessness, and rather it's a range of factors. Um, these are key to our shared work in this council to assure a coordinated response. Also, also notable are the gender and racial differences that were detected of who exits homelessness permanently. So I encourage any of you who have not read this to access, access this via the link, along with other resources that we provided, um, including Lassa's report um, showing how structural racism, discrimination, and unconscious bias in housing, employment, criminal justice, criminal welfare policies have led to the overrepresentation of people experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. 
there was a, um, we are going to hold questions um, until after our presenters speak, just knowing that we have a packed agenda. And so if you have any questions, just hang on to them. We will get to them. Um, and I will turn it, uh, I will turn it straight over to our presenters. Um, first, I would like to present to Tamika Moss, the wonderful Tamika Moss, who's the founder in chief of Founder and Chief Executive of All Home. Tamika, are you there? I'm here. Excellent. Nice <laughs> to see you. Thank you for joining us. Oh, your, thank you so much for having me. Your slides are all uh, are on deck, and, and I'll turn it to you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Council Members. Um, Secretary Ramirez, I'm so happy to be with you to walk you through, uh, really building on some of what Julie just talked about. Um, and frankly, to lift up some of the fantastic work that is happening across the Bay Area with respect to addressing racial equity uh, and homelessness. So I'm going to walk you through a few slides and we'll be happy to take questions from the council um, at the conclusion of, of the, my presentation. So am I advancing? Uh, All, right. Advance, you got it. All right, next slide, please. So, so um, just a little bit about All Home. All Home is a new organization, and our focus is really centered around the nine county Bay Area, trying to look at the intersections of poverty and homelessness, redressing the disparities that we're talking about with respect to race, and how do we in fact create more economic uh, mobility opportunities for extremely low income people in the reason, in the region. And I think it's important here to just acknowledge that it is a myriad of factors that are going to um, help us reduce the disparate uh, racial impacts um, of people experiencing homelessness. And we are, you know, certainly our organization is grounded in racial equity and ensuring that as we develop our policies and system change and, and test the status quo, that that is at the center of our work. Um, and we do that in partnership with cities and counties throughout the Bay Area to really figure out how can we bring best practices, evidence-based practices, and support to regions who are committed to addressing racial equity and homelessness. Um, next slide. There's a bit of a delay. I hope everybody, well, okay, here we go. Uh, all right, so I thought it would be important just to um, begin my presentation to kind of outline why it matters. Um, from my perspective, it's actually not a choice point whether or not we pay attention to racial equity when we are addressing the homelessness crisis, because in fact, our Black, Brown, and Indigenous folks are disproportionately impacted by this crisis. And if we're going to solve it, as this council is charged to do, then we have to actually put racial equity at the center of what we're doing. And so this slide is just sort of articulating what, who is most impacted. And I think um, you saw that in the slides um, that preceded when you look statewide, um, really paying attention to the fact that African-Americans in particular um, are disproportionately impacted, even in communities where African-American people are not um, a significant portion of the general population their representation in the homelessness space is, is still overrepresented. So I think it's important when we tie the, the solutions to addressing racial equity, we have to pay attention to structural race, racism and the discrimination um, that African-American folks faced and continue to face as they seek housing justice in the Bay Area and in the state of California. And I, I understand that this council, of course, recognizes that, but it's it's for all of the time that it's spent us to secure these systems, we have to be just as vigilant and persistent to disrupting them. Um, and I wanted to just highlight, and, and you'll see later in my presentation, some call outs to um, counties that are doing a fantastic job of putting racial equity at the center of their service um, and systems interventions. But I wanted to call out Contra Costa County here who really, um, who did a racial equity analysis as a part of their work, and just wanted to highlight a couple of bullets here at the bottom of the screen, which again, talks about how, how we have to pay attention to each 
part of the systems of care and where they intersect with people to ensure that we are achieving racial equity outcomes. Um, so I just wanted to highlight, particularly the service, the program utilization, um, that in fact, African-American folks are the highest uh, utilizers of prevention and rapid resolution services. Um, and in fact, they continue to be overrepresented in this county with respect to the front end of the system. So I thought that that was um, key and recognizing that one of the very first things that we have to do is disaggregate our data. I think uh, Secretary Ramirez referenced this. We don't know what we don't know unless we have the information to find out what the problems are. So we must use our data to recognize what disparities actually exist and then take the courageous action to do something about it. Next slide, please. Um, so this, uh, and I'll run quickly here because I feel like the theme is pretty clear, but I wanted to just outline relative to other marginalized groups who are experiencing homelessness. I think the indigenous population here is even more uh, critical, imp critically important for us to pay attention to as the percentage of indigenous people in the state and in the region is relatively low, but they represent their proportion of those experiencing homelessness is quite stark. So again, I think it's important for us to understand the persistence, even as we deliver our services with the racial equity lens, unless we undo some of the structural um, challenges that remain in place, we're still going to see the disparate impacts. So I thought it was important just to see this across the scale for all uh, for other ethnic groups that are disproportionately represented in the homelessness space. Next slide, please. I thought this was important because, you know, when we think about how to disrupt the status quo around who's falling into homelessness and who's exposed to it, we have to talk about the income and wealth gaps that exist for people of color. And I thought this was an important reference point to understand just how stark uh, the wealth gap is in the Bay Area. And if we're gonna make any headway around really, you know, we know how to house people, but what we haven't been able to accomplish is eco economic mobility and prosperity for very extremely low income people uh, in our region. And so unless we look at wealth building opportunities and resources that allow folks to increase their income over time, compete for com competitive wages, have access to education and skill building, then we're really not getting to that core of what is perpetuating and keeping homelessness in place for certain groups of people. Next slide, please. Um, this slide, I thought, again, referencing sort of where the discrimination and um, structural racism really begins uh, at the federal level. Many of our federal policies wrote into doctrine um, how people of color were not able to access a real estate, uh, certain communities, et cetera. And this looks at sort of how we typically think about wealth generation is through real estate and who has access to that through tax subsidies. And this is just highlighting who in fact gets access um, at what income level to those assets. And you can see the top line takeaway is that families of color are again, not accessing these opportunities to build wealth in their families and in their communities. And I just want to say, I often give these, these talks and I hear myself talking about sort of the deficit that communities are experiencing, but I want to just take a moment to talk about the resilience of our communities of color, how in fact the, the fact that they are have experienced um, barriers, structural barriers, uh, and that persists over hundreds of years and are still standing and are still engaging and working toward housing and racial justice. I just think it's important to recognize the assets that uh, members of our community are bringing, even though they are exposed to um, incredible challenges, uh, we have an opportunity to really put their voices first 
and make sure that we are building leadership capacity um, for people with lived experience and people with lived expertise to help us uh, lead and change the outcomes and trend lines that seem so persistent in our neighborhood. So I just wanted to take a moment to, to acknowledge that because I think it can sometimes feel quite um, sobering um, when we look at the data. Next slide, please. Um, I, I, I don't know if it was Secretary Ramirez or maybe Julie that talked about the housing supply. I, I just want to acknowledge Council Member Loving, um, who really has helped the region, uh, and particularly Santa Clara County, understand the critical importance of developing and producing extremely low income housing for the region. And this slide reflects our regional housing needs assessment and how we've done across each of the income um, categories with respect to the production of housing. And as you can see, not only have we done our best work at producing above moderate income housing, progressively um, down the chart here, you can see just how under-resourced we are with respect to ELI housing. And I just want to highlight that for a moment, because if we are going to provide housing opportunities for people who are extremely low income and experiencing homelessness, then we have to have deeply subsidized housing that they can afford. And our finance, housing financing system, nor our subsidy programs really incentivize at the scale that we need the production of this housing. So I think it's important as the council thinks about its priorities in your action plan to really think about how does the state and, and the counties uh, and the cities prioritize EI, ELI housing production. Next slide, please. So I wanted to, to uh, lift up some work that I was a part of with the National Innovation Service through um, responding to the COVID crisis and looking at the racial impacts for communities of color um, around the country. And I wanted to just highlight a couple of um, components or pieces that we heard from folks. We had a very robust process that included voices from many marginalized communities all across the nation. And my takeaway here was that we actually need to listen to what the people who are experiencing this crisis most acutely really need from the systems that are there to support them. And I wanted to highlight in particular this last point where it talks about, oh, did I do that? Oh, sorry. No, that's on us. Oh, no problem. Okay. Um, where it calls out how do we pay attention to culturally relevant employment services and housing interventions that actually respond most deeply to what people in the community need? And I just, for your reference, and this is a part of your, your packet, but I thought some of the, the, um, the comments that we heard from the community just reinforces how critical it is to have um, folks with lived experience and expertise at the table as a part of the decision making. Next slide. So wanted to just take a couple of minutes to talk very specifically about what some of our counties are doing in the Bay Area. Um, wanting to highlight the Destination Home in partnership with Spark and some of their other local partners. Um, did a homelessness and race, uh, race report for Santa Clara County that really highlighted the importance, as I've mentioned already, about having um, voices of people of color at the table in your program design and in your fundraise, funding decision making, uh, in evaluating the effectiveness of the program delivery system. Um, so just super important. Um, so that we're testing our assumptions of how these systems are actually working for the people who need them the most. The last one I wanted to highlight here from Santa Clara County was really adopting new housing and land use policies that help reverse the housing disparities that persist. I think that piece is critically important because unless we understand how entrenched 
the disparities are and frankly the the policies that continue to perpetuate the same outcomes we can't really adjust the programs well enough unless we disrupt the system that keeps them in place so i thought that that was a really important takeaway from santa clara county's work alameda county also has been doing a great deal of work around racial um, equity analysis in their systems modeling for their entire homelessness system for the county. They've engaged all the cities within the county to really look at, you know, how much interim and bridge housing do we need? What do communities of color actually need with respect to housing exits? How should the services and programs actually be delivered for the folks, folks who are most impacted? So again, that to me is where you begin to take the theory into action. And these counties are doing it incredibly well. Um, last example here, um, San Francisco uh, City and County has also in, um, participated in the SPARC initiative, which is the national organization that is helping uh, jurisdictions lead the, lead the work around their racial equity analysis. And, you know, this one really highlights um, an equitable coordinated entry system. You know, as we know, coordinated entry was a federal requirement, and yet people, as, as folks have implemented their coordinated entry systems, have, have continued to see racial disparities um, uh, persist, even in their attempt to be more equitable in their programs, uh, and interventions. And so again, I think it requires that diligence and discipline to constantly evaluating how, what impacts you're actually making and course correcting in real time. Um, and you can see again, some of the other um, strategies that jurisdictions are employing to ensure that they're maintaining a commitment to racial equity. And in fact, changing how they deliver their, their, their systems of care in order to achieve more equitable outcomes. Next slide. So um, I wanted to just kind of do a summary of what you've already seen throughout my presentation, but work that All Home thinks is critically important and that we will continue to support um, the state and the counties and the region to think about. Um, who's at the table? This moment in time, I think with um, the sort of racial awakening that is happening in the United States at this time, I think is just highlighting what we already knew before COVID and before this racial awakening. That if in fact you want to provide the most um, effective interventions for people who are impacted by homelessness, you need to engage them in your processes. Who's leading the organizations that are serving people of color? How do we ensure that those folks are also building capacity and leadership within their organizations to make sure that when I'm getting a service, I have somebody who looks like me in the community that I'm, that I'm um, seeking services in. Um, racial equity lens always, I think the action plan and the state and the governor is deeply committed to um, an equity agenda for um, the state of California and BCSH, I think through, um, through Secretary Ramirez's leadership is committed to this as well. We have to use our data effectively, but then we have to make sure that we have the systems and supports in place for jurisdictions to do something different with that data. Once you know who's impacted, how are you trying to remedy that? And I think very directly, one of the ways that All Home thinks about this is if you know that African-American, Latinx, and indigenous people are disproportionately impacted based on their percentage in the general population, how do we get those to, to more parity? And so I think that there's some very specific ways to make sure you're targeting the right things in order to see the impacts that you want. And these last two, I won't repeat, but the last, um, the housing security and economic security from our perspective are inextricably linked. People who are housing insecure are often economically insecure. So we have to start thinking of policies and, and interventions that are interspersed and, and intersectional so that we can do a better job of protecting and supporting our most vulnerable residents in our community. So I believe that is the last of my slides. Am I right, Evan? 
I believe so, yes. <laughs> all right, now. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions that council uh, members might have or any or anyone from the public. Thank you. Thank you, Tamika. Thank you so much for that uh, very comprehensive presentation. And I, um, I, I know that um, I'm sure council members have questions. Uh, I think what we will do is uh, go to the second presenter and then come back and then take questions at the time. I do, you know, just as a point of uh, personal privilege, I really appreciated <laughs> um, uh, what you said with regard to um, the asset building model. Um, it very much reminds me of, um, you know, community building, right? Building communities from the inside out. And so you start with bringing people with lived experience that have, a, you know, a perspective being on, you know, on the other end to help inform and strengthen uh, the response to services and the systems. And so thank you very much for reminding us of the importance of doing that work. So I think uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask uh, Julie to introduce our second presenter. Carla, are you there? I see you. Okay. Yes, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Yes. You're here. So, so next, I'd like to introduce Carla Shalif, Chief Operating and Legal Officer of Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, who will talk about the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness. Thanks, Carla. Hi, thank you. And thanks so much for having me. Um, so I guess we are ready to go with the slides. So let's move to the next slide. Okay. So LASA is the lead agency in the Los Angeles Continuum of Care, which is the regional planning body that coordinates housing and services for homeless families and individuals in Los Angeles County. LASA coordinates and manages over 400 million annually, annually in federal, state, county, and city funds for programs that provide shelter, housing, and services to people experiencing homelessness. Through LASA funding, program design, outcomes assessment, and technical assistance that provide it to more than 100 nonprofit partner agencies that assist people experiencing homelessness to achieve independence and stability in permanent housing. Our partner agencies provide a continuum of programs ranging from outreach, access centers, emergency shelters, safe havens, transitional and permanent housing and prevention, along with the necessary supportive services designed to provide the tools and skills required to attain a stable housing environment. Next slide. So as the Ad Hoc Committee launched in April of 2018, we used data from the 2017 point in time count. This slide illustrates the 2017 data used in the report. Black people made up 9% of the general population in LA County and represented 40% of people experiencing homelessness. Our 2019 point in time count, which you might hear referred to as homeless count, shows that black people in LA continue to be four times more likely to experience homelessness with black people making up 8% of the general population in LA County while representing 33% of people experiencing homelessness. Next slide. Oh, there's a delay. Did you all see the graph yet? Oh, okay. So that's what I was just talking about, <laughs> about the overrepresentation. So let's go to the next slide. I think the slide is coming up, Riley. I think we, we can see it as soon as okay. it comes up. Yeah. Okay. So the persistent overrepresentation of Black people among the population experiencing homelessness is a troubling reality across the United States. Los Angeles is no exception. In recognition of the urgent need to dedicate focused attention to better understand and address this critical issue, the LASA Commission established the Ad Hoc Committee on Black People Experiencing Homelessness to lead this effort. The LASA Commission approved committee membership in December of 2017, and the committee launched in April of 2018. The committee was formed in response to the persistent overrepresentation of Black people experiencing homelessness and the impact of the ad hoc committee on women and homelessness. The committee was established with three core goals. 
to better understand factors contributing to the troubling overrepresentation, to identify gaps or opportunities to increase racial equity, and to develop recommendations for improvements to policy, funding, program design, or service delivery to reduce barriers and more effectively meet the needs of Black people experiencing homelessness. We sometimes get questions about why it was called Black and not African American or some other um, term, and it's because we got a lot of feedback that was really helpful that uh, the other terms did not include everybody. There were um, Afro-Latinx, there was Afro-Caribbean, there were different populations that were represented, and we wanted to make sure that we were um, getting everybody, and so the term Black was used. Um, next slide. The committee was chaired by two LASA commissioners and comprised of 24 additional members from various backgrounds and areas of expertise, including homeless service providers, representatives from local elected offices, representatives from key city and county agencies, community activists, organizers, and faith leaders, as well as individuals with lived expertise. We were very intentional in seating the committee and inviting a broad range of stakeholders to be at the table because we knew that we couldn't do this work within the homeless service system alone, but that we needed leaders from multiple sectors with a wide range of experience and expertise. Um, next slide, please. Great. The committee adopted the use of a racial equity toolkit, a nationally recognized six-step process designed to inform and assess how policies, programs, and budgetary decisions burden and or benefit Black people experiencing homelessness. The toolkit provided the basis from which the committee developed recommendations. The toolkit promotes racial equity by listening to the voices of those most impacted, people with lived expertise of homelessness, as well as those directly serving them, to understand how policies, programs, and services within the homeless delivery system and other intersecting systems benefit or burden Black people experiencing homelessness. Raising awareness of racial justice issues for those providing services and community members, working across governmental systems with other institutions and with community members to align strategies to eliminate racial disparities impacting Black people experiencing homelessness, and evaluating progress over time and demonstrating a commitment to share results with community members. Next slide. The committee held focus groups and community listening sessions across LA County to learn from the expert voices of those currently experiencing and on the brink of homelessness, as well as provider staff who are on the front lines of the system. The committee examined the institutional and structural barriers facing Black people in various upstream and mainstream systems, including housing and labor markets, the criminal justice system, and the child welfare system. And we explored how these barriers lead to overrepresentation in the population experiencing homelessness. The committee also took a critical look at the experiences and outcomes of Black people within the homeless services system, including the Coordinated Entry System, or CES, access and assessment, as well as permanent housing, both permanent housing programs and services within CES, and public and affordable housing beyond CES. Through this work, the committee developed a set of 67 recommendations that cut across issues and they call for cross-system action to advance racial equity. Next slide. So we hope you'll all have the opportunity to review the committee's full report. Um, we're gonna provide you with a high level overview of the key insights and recommendations that emerge from the report. I think it may, the link may have been sent to you all. If it hasn't, we can do that. Um, I'd also like to highlight, we've included quotes from the listening sessions, focus groups in these slides to give you a sense of what was heard during the process. The community part of this process was really important. Um, next slide, please. In response to the question, why do you think Black people are overrepresented in the homeless population, community less listening session participants overwhelmingly identified generations of racism as the root cause of homelessness. The circumstances that lead Black people to disproportionately, experiencing, to disproportionately experience homelessness cannot be untangled from the impact of institutional and structural racism in education, criminal justice, housing, employment, issues that affect Black people on a daily, lifelong basis. For example, a history of segregation and redlining has severely precluded Black people from home ownership opportunities, eliminating the possibility 
of the intergenerational transfer of wealth that Americans have traditionally used as an engine of upward mobility. The committee acknowledged that the current disparities are a function of these pervasive racial biases rather than individual challenges and a product of decades of systemic issues and structural racism. And for lasting change to occur, institutional barriers across agencies and mainstream systems must be dismantled to eliminate the racial disparities and systemic racism affecting Black people experiencing homelessness. Next slide. To begin addressing these structural issues, LASA is committed to launching a racial equity plan, um, conducting a careful analysis of contracting and hiring practices, and ensuring that these processes are advancing racial equity within our own organizations and those with which we contract, while also emphasizing the need to enhance and require ongoing trainings in areas that help staff and providers confront implicit biases, cultural competency, and impacts of discrimination against Black people. Next slide. In addition to examining upstream and mainstream systems of care, the committee took a careful look at the homeless services system itself, as well as housing more broadly. A core component of the committee's analysis of this system focused on the front door of coordinated entry, including assessment, outreach, and interim housing. At every session, participants focused on program and service delivery shortcomings. A basic concern can be summed up as a lack of compassion or the low quality of case management due to overly burdened case managers, lack of follow through, excessive turnover rate, lack of lived expertise, et cetera. Those the previous uh, um, presentation addressed that, that we heard a lot of feedback that there are, are not people at the front who look like me, they are not people at the front who sound like me. They are not people at the front desk who have been through what I've been through. And it stops a lot of communication, to be quite honest, and it and affects people's access to services. Another thing that came up time and time again was issues with the triage tool. Uh, participants and provider staff shared concerns about the assessment process and the length of the CES assessment tool, particularly when a relationship with the client has not been established. There were concerns about re-traumatizing, um, asking the same questions repeatedly for people who've been through some really horrendous stories. Um, we're also examining the tool now for instances where there's just some, some cultural competency gaps. Um, one of the examples is that we heard from our listening sessions that um, black men may not automatically want to say, I've been incarcerated. Um, that might not be something that they want to immediately share with someone doing an assessment that they don't know. Um, there may be issues with also answering questions about uh, mental health. So we're trying to find ways to phrase things. Um, that recognize some of those barriers. Um, next slide, please. So some of the related recommendations include um, conducting rigorous and robust data analysis uh, to examine and evaluate the efficacy and appropriateness of our existing tools and to make sure that they are capturing the vulnerabilities of the Black participants experiencing homelessness. But to designate funding to provide outreach teams and an expanded network of traditional and non-traditional sites, access to one-time financial housing assistance that can prevent homelessness further upstream by serving those whose needs are less acute and who may not otherwise access support through the homeless service system. And also examining the funding and services structure of interim housing programs and consider increasing the bed rate to allow for a higher level of case management support and standard of care and for more culturally relevant services. Uh, next slide, please. These insights focus both on the outcomes of CES permanent housing programs and on permanent housing beyond the homeless services system, including tenants' rights in the private market, public housing, and affordable housing. Community members consistently raise the issue of an inadequate supply of affordable housing in Los Angeles County, as well as the permanent housing resources within CES, particularly for those who have fixed or no income, such as seniors and people with disabilities. Black people experiencing homelessness who are placed into housing through CES permanent housing programs have a higher rate of return to homelessness than other race and ethnic groups. In terms of outside CES, people often wait years to obtain a housing choice voucher, and the subsidy amount is often too low for Los Angeles rental rates. Mm -hmm. Racial discrimination prevents Black people from securing rentals of their choice, and there are broader tenant protections and enforcement mechanisms that are needed across LA County. Next slide, please. 
So advocacy for expanding the tenant protections, reducing barriers to housing access, and furthering affordable housing development at the state and local level are uh, LASA supported the positions on AB 1482 to expand just cause eviction protections and to cap annual rent increases. Um, we engaged in similar efforts on SB 329 to prohibit source of income discrimination statewide. And we also supported and advocated for AB 53 to prohibit discrimination by landlords based on history of justice system involvement. Um, LASA supported state budget and legislative efforts to expand the state low income housing tax credit to increase affordable housing production. Next slide. Next slide, sorry. So LASA staff are working internally to move toward the committee's recommendations specific to LASA and are working closely with our city and county partners. Uh, we've also recently contracted with USC professor um, Henri Hancock Alfaro, whose racial equity team will be responsible for connecting with all agencies, personnel and systems that are mentioned in the work in order to develop implementation plans and community engaged assessments. And we're excited to have her and the racial equity team from USC on board to move this for work forward across the county. Um, we've also created a director of equity role, and while we're searching for a candidate, we've partnered with the National Innovation Service to lead equity work until the role is filled at LASA. Um, we're a member of the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, GARE, uh, through which a cohort of staff meets regularly to receive training and share best practices. Uh, we've made strides in applying racial equity lens to our contracting, hiring, and training practices. Uh, we've accomplished this by refining approach to recruitment and organizing trainings on how to have inclusive conversations about race. We've also infused robust race and ethnicity data collection, reporting, and transparency through all aspects of the agency's work to monitor trends and adapt strategies. Um, lastly, we're preparing to launch our CES triage tool research and refinement project, which is what I was speaking um, about before in partnership with UCLA and USC to inform refinements to advance equity, improve system flow, um, and increase confidence in the system to support appropriate service connections. Next slide. So to help prioritize which of the 67 recommendations to address first, at USC um, racial equity team completed a feasibility analysis, which was fabulous. So the factors analyzed included the time to implementation, um, one year or more than three years, and the cost of implementation, are there existing funds, will we need new funds, the complexity of the implementation, so how many systems are gonna be involved in this process, um, and the public traction for implementation especially with COVID-19. So the analysis identified 21 hot start or early win opportunities that can be focused on during our pilot implementation by the work groups. Um, by December, Dr. Alfaro's team will convene a series of work groups to focus on implementing these recommendations. Uh, the work group membership will consist in, of our system partners, community-based organizations, and those with lived expertise. So our plan is to work over the next 24 months to implement, assess, and produce a community-engaged, evidence-driven initiative that will institutionalize the changes we've collectively determined will work for best reducing the numbers of Black people experiencing homelessness. Um, finally, we recognize that our efforts in this area are not within a vacuum, but that we're part of a broader racial equity movement, and our hope is that our commitment to this work and our commitment to transparency and sharing our successes and challenges will support the movement for racial equity that is growing locally and across the nation. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you so much. And um, just to uh, you know, want to lift up LASA and the leadership of um, the, the board and the staff and, you know, the, the many stakeholders in LA that were part of this process. Um, I think that, you know, listening to uh, both you and, and Tamika as we go um, in a few minutes, you know, to the next item on the agenda, the action plan, I think this is, you know, very sort of a helpful reminder that as we develop our action plan, um, that we need to ensure that it is grounded on, um, you know, racial equity and, um, uh, you know, very much the the lessons and the recommendations, right, um, uh, that you all have been sharing with us in terms of uh, what is happening at, at the uh, kind of local level. So very much appreciated. We are a little bit behind schedule, but it's um, we 
we are good. Um, so we're <laughs> going to spend maybe the next you know, 10 minutes or so on a discussion, uh, questions, comments uh, for our two um, expert uh, presenters. And so council members, if you would like to speak, either kind of raise your hand or signal and we'll call on you. So I see uh, Jennifer Loving, council member Loving. Hi, thank you. Thank you both. Nice to see you, Tamika, and nice to meet you, Carla. Uh, Carla, can you send us the presentation that you just gave? We're in Santa Clara County doing something similar, and I love the way you're articulating sort of how you're going to measure, how you're going to uh, demonstrate the, the work moving forward. So if you if it's okay to share that, we would love it. And Absolutely. Jennifer, just a heads up that, that given timing, um, we got them this morning because we were delayed on our end. And so we'll be updating them on the actual website. Um, so they'll be public because we, we Thank you. do that and we want to do that. <laughs> I think I saw council member um, Gilman. Yeah, thank you both of you so much for the presentation. It's more just a comment for fellow council members for our next agenda item when we're looking at our action plans and outcomes. I wanted to do sort of a through thread that in both presentations, and I don't know if Carla or Tamika want to speak to it more, coordinated entry CES was raised in both presentations as a very strong um, barrier to ending you know, racial inequality in our homeless population. And so I just think this council needs to think about when we're looking at our recommendations later and our action plan for the next year, how we as a council might wanna to look to correct, to course correct or make adjustments or recommend that from a state perspective adjustments, COCs and counties on CES to try to end racial disparities. So there was a lot of connection in both presentations, but that was the one that struck me the most. And I wanted to call that out to my fellow council members. I would just say that anytime we're creating systems, I think that people do it with the best intentions. I'd like to think that. Um, and that when we forget to involve the community in the process, especially those most deeply impacted by whatever system we're trying to create for them, um, when we don't have them as part of the process, we miss a lot of really important steps. And so we heard a lot of really um, vital things at those community listening sessions. And it was a lot of uh, trauma that was aired and a lot of feelings and it wasn't easy to be honest to hear um, but it was really really important and i think that it's a step that most of us probably skip when we're creating things um, it's timely and it and it can be expensive and it's difficult but i think that that doing getting that feedback on the front end solves a lot of problems that we have to end up addressing later tamika i think you're trying to speak. Oh, I think I'm, okay. am I? Okay. I just would add, I agree with that. I think the, the, the challenge also is sometimes the sort of what we're trying to advance in terms of a policy solution is, is incongruent with, you know, geographic uh, impacts. Uh, in Oakland, for example, um, when the system was really designed to try to look at highest acuity for people who were chronically homeless, factoring in behavioral health challenges, it actually missed the fact that African American folks weren't exhibiting those high um, behavioral substance abuse and, and mental health challenges. And so when they were scored in their coordinated entry system, they were less acute. So I think it's as these systems are, are uh, implemented, we should realize that they shouldn't be static and we should have ways to iterate on them over time based on the data so that we can actually be much more culturally responsive to what the communities actually need. Yes, Council Member Anderson. You know, I guess I, just in listening to these presentations, I just wanted to share a thought that is perhaps obvious to others, but, uh, you know, to me, one of, one aspect of this work that I think is so um, exciting is that, that using these lenses, using this lens to adjust the way that we're doing our work is just, going to, I'm confident, lead to better outcomes 
overall, right? Um, that we're we're kind of working towards leading with a racial equity lens, but that racial equity lens is just going to get us to um, just overall better system outcomes. And I think that that is um, is 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 exciting and and helpful to the work we're doing. So. And that's Thank a you. great point. We're highlighting and lifting that up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a, it, that's been, it's a great point in that it's also helped us in having conversations with some people who are more resistant to, to the topic, that if we can address the issues that are impacting the most represented group in homelessness, that those lessons have, are bound to affect other people who are experiencing homelessness and assist the entire population. So um, it, it's not in a vacuum, it's not exclusionary, it's actually inclusionary. And if, if we can solve it for, for this group, it, would, it will help everybody. Great. Jody, see your hand. Can you talk a little bit about how you partner with others to disrupt the systems of oppression? Um, because obviously as we're doing the work, those old systems still exist. And um, like what kind of partnerships you have in, in terms of that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, and, and Carla, it sounds like your work is actually designed around partnerships. Um, I think the the what we've seen in the Bay Area is that the partnerships that we found most helpful are partnerships across various systems that are perpetuating the structural inequities uh, that show up in homelessness, right? So when we're talking about the criminal justice system, foster care, um, you know, d d insufficient access to competitive employment, it's important to engage those stakeholders in conversations with respect to addressing homelessness and housing insecurity. Because if we are only focused on the homelessness system, then we're missing the point around the structural inequities that have perpetuated these challenges in the first place. So we've really engaged workforce development systems, um, the business community, philanthropic partners. How do we get our, our uh, employers to consider ELI and um, people of color as the pipeline and workers of the future. So we've really looked at that intersectional nature. Our health providers, for example, we're now partnering with them and bringing them to the table to talk about how does health, wealth, and housing intersect if we're actually going to disrupt who's, be, who's, who's having um, uh, disproportionate impacts based on homelessness. And so for us, partnerships is broadening the tent beyond the homelessness response system and really engaging uh, stakeholders throughout the ecosystem who, who can change the trajectories of wealth, health, and housing outcomes um, for people experiencing homelessness. Thank we you. also um, made sure that they were at the table from the beginning. So uh, it's, it's harder to be dismissive of the goals and the recommendations when you are involved in authoring them. And so people, and also I think hearing those stories of trauma and the community feedback was really important for those different um, departments to hear. And so they got involved in the process itself. And I think that that really impacted um, their buy-in uh, to the results and to having success. They're, they're part of it. They want to see it do well. Thank you. Great. I think uh, Councilman um, Atterbury. Yeah, just a simple request to, to get the maybe contact information for Carla and Tamika. That'd be great. Uh, I'd love to be able to connect uh, our veteran resources to you guys in LA and in the Bay Area. Definitely. We'll, we will make sure to follow up and share that information. All right. Any additional comments or questions? Okay, well again, thank you so much, uh, Tamika and Carla. Thank you for your leadership for today's um, presentation and the engaging conversation. It's very relevant you know, to this next item that's on the agenda. Uh, but before we go to the agenda, just wanna um, ask staff, um, do we take public comment after this? No, because it's not an action item. Okay, well, thank you again, appreciate it. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. So continuing with the agenda, the next item on the agenda is uh, an action item uh, related to our um, HCFC priorities and objectives uh, specific to the action plan. And uh, just in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and hand this over to our Deputy Secretary for Homelessness, uh, Ali Sutton, uh, who will also be co-presenting um, with um, a consultant, uh, HCFC consultant, uh, Matthew Doherty. Uh, and just, you know, Matthew, thank you uh, very much for uh, moving very quickly <laughs> at an accelerate, accelerated rate uh, to get us uh, this this far uh, to you and to Ali and, and uh, so excited to, to uh, have before us the framework and the 15 objectives uh, that you guys will guide us through. Great, thanks. Thank you, Secretary, and and yes, thanks and thanks to all of you for um, being available for conversations, et cetera, to to move on the timeline that that we have. Um, we've been very mindful of we don't want the planning process to take longer than the actual plan itself. So, <laughs> um, so thank you all for that. Uh, Evan, next slide. Yes, we do have our uh, additional council member that has joined. Oh yeah. Um, so it, it looks like we uh, have had Joe Ukashiba join us. Uh, Joe, if you're here, uh, like to call you in for roll. Uh, Council Member Joe Ukashiba. Oh. Joe, I think you might be muted. Yes, I'm here. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go through quickly because I think some of this we we talked a little bit about at last meeting, but I just want to make sure that we're grounded in some of this before we move on to the actual objectives that have been drafted. Um, so just keeping in mind that our, our plan for this is really to identify the priorities that we'll talk about in our HCSC meetings to really strengthen the work between state agencies and between state and local partners. Um, really to align strategies across our, our different state agencies to make sure we're focusing on best practices, to make sure we're moving in the same direction in a coordinated way so that local communities sort of understand how we as a state think they should be, they should be moving forward. Um, we, we, we really are thinking about this as the objectives we're going to be talking about today are sort of these umbrella areas in which we will add um, sort of specific action areas and action items moving forward. Those action items might be things that are already being done. They might be things that have to take place jointly across state agencies or might be happening independently within agencies. But, but really sort of as we think about these objectives, these are not the actions. These are the, the umbrella items in which the actions will fall under. Um, and really in the attempt to, to make sure that we're holding ourselves accountable to what we're supposed to be doing here, why we are meeting, what work we're trying to do, and how we are actually going to move the needle. Um, in addition, I think really a lot of learning that has happened um, due to this pandemic and making sure we understand that right now and implement our learnings from that over the next couple of years into just how we do better work in, in our homeless response system. Um, so just a, a little bit of a framing on some of that about why we're doing this uh, as we move on to our next slide. Um, so you all know we've brought on Matthew. Um, he's become a, a, a regular at these meetings. Um, we're really thinking about and have been having the, the conversation around um, these discussions based in that framework for equitable COVID-19 response. Um, you'll see that still sort of fleshed out within the way that we've outlined the objectives for today. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's how we will display these at the end of our, of our final action plan as a council, but um, has continued to be a very useful resource, I think, in thinking through the different components we need to cover. Um, this has been in close coordination with the governor's office. They have seen these objectives and understand what we are trying to do. Um, we've had conversations with all of you all. We've also, since our last meeting, had num a number of external stakeholder meetings and conversations um, of which the, these objectives uh, are sort of representative of we, what we heard from those folks. So um, a whole range of, of, uh, of stakeholders, but particularly given um, the last conversation we were just having, a really important flag that, that did include um, people with lived expertise and that we anticipate doing more of this even after this first um, this meeting. That was a very short <laughs> six weeks or so, five weeks or so between our last meeting and now, and we have more folks we'd like to talk to um, and, and expect to talk to, to moving forward. Um, we've also had dialogues across other state agencies, sort of folks that are not necessarily represented with a council member right now, 
um, but that have a seat at the table that we are trying to fill. So we've talked to um, CDE, we've talked to CDCR, we've talked to a community college representative trying to make sure we're getting the full range of our, our state partners in the conversation um, as well. The next slide. And then just a, a quick reminder of the speed at which we are moving. <laughs> um, so we are hoping for today to approve sort of an initial draft of these objectives. I say that in that we're really hoping that this conversation um, doesn't necessarily, isn't so much about wordsmithing these as our final objectives so much as are we missing anything? Um, are there pieces we really feel are critical to call out as we move forward with these general umbrella area, areas to add some meat to and to sort of empower HCSC staff to move forward on? So just a little bit of a framing there. At our meeting in December, we'll talk a little bit more tweaking sort of what, what could fall under some of these things, what else we've heard from some of our external stakeholders. Um, we may throw in another meeting in there at some point, we're still in the midst of scheduling, but with the expectation that by the, our March HCSC meeting, we are adopting and approving a, a full plan to move forward with. Um, and just, I'm not sure this was entirely clear in the last meeting, so it felt important to just call out. I think we've mentioned it to a lot of you since that meeting, but we really are seeing this as a two year time horizon, likely with a check in at a year. Um, lots of things are changing in the world right now, and this would be something that's a bit longer than that felt a little um, premature. Also, acknowledging this is our very first action plan, and so we want to see how it goes and have the opportunity to continue to tweak it. So, thinking about the actions we start putting underneath these and the objectives as themselves as things that could be potentially done uh, at the state level within that two year period. I just wanted to make, sure, make, make a point of that. Um, and that these drafts, as I mentioned, do include all of the feedback we've heard from all of you, both in individual conversations as well as the last meeting and with our discussion with external stakeholders. Um, so really just, I think we can go to the next slide, Evan, thanks. Oh, not quite, sorry, mm -hmm. I lied. Um, so really just trying to frame up some of the conversation and, and how to be thinking about these objectives as, as Matthew um, goes into them here in a second. I really think we're hoping that this is a conversation that, that leads us into um, empowering staff to be moving forward to that next conversation in December, to start adding some of the meat to this, but really not thinking about these as rock solid only, you know, th this is exactly how they will be worded in our final plan. So just a little bit of framing there because I think that gives us a little bit of flexibility to, to keep the conversation at a, what are we missing? Um, does anybody think any of these aren't relevant or important? Um, do we need to be thinking about adding certain pieces to the puzzle? Really trying to understand at a high umbrella level, are there any umbrellas that we need to be inviting into the table that we've missed? or any umbrellas that really aren't as, as interesting or as important as we think they might be and, and have included them here. So just a little bit of a framing and hope, and, and hope that that's helpful for the, the conversation. Um, and so with that, for the, the sake of time, I'll hand it over to, to Matthew to go through these quickly. Um, and you all should have the, the document in hand. Um, I would just a call out to anybody listening uh, from the public. It is on our website, so you can take a look there as well. Um, I believe it's a two-pager, maybe three-pager, um, that is in our meeting our meeting agenda and our meeting topic area. So just a call out. All right, Matthew, all you. Thank you, Allie, and thanks everyone. It's glad to join you all again today. So just a quick reminder, as Ali mentioned, that uh, the framework for an equitable COVID-19 homelessness response has provided the framing structure through which we've had the conversations um, with all of you and with external stakeholders and has been the, the frame that we've used to outline this draft set of objectives that you're reviewing today. Uh, for folks who are using that framework and other elements of your work, just a, a, a plug that a revised version of the framework was released early next week that uh, significantly restructured the framework to try to bring more focus to the work. Next slide, please. But it stays focused on, and this, this uh, current structure stays focused on these five action areas, unsheltered people, shelter, housing, diversion and prevention, and strengthening systems for the future. And again, so far we've outlined the objectives in alignment with this structure. We've gotten some feedback around that that uh, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. So again, we may not stick with this being the organizing structure for the final set of objectives and strategies, um, but it really has helped expedite a lot of the early conversations and planning and provided a way to focus in, in uh, I think what has proven to be a really helpful way. And again, as Ali was discussing, the, 
the intent of, a, of uh, adopting the objectives is then to allow the deeper planning conversations around strategies and activities to be organized in a similarly uh, focused way um, and that would be looking at a full range of strategies and activities to build this out to be a really uh, an action plan that could be uh, strategies related to data, could be strategies related to guidance and tools, technical assistance, partnerships, um, highlighting and replicating uh, successful practices, communication strategies, federal advocacy. And really for each of these objectives, we'll be trying to engage in dialogue to think about what are the right tools to mobilize that are gonna have the most impact, but thinking broadly about what the toolbox is that's available to the council and to the state agencies. Next slide, please. So, and this does exactly mirror the information that is in the handout that was provided for the meeting. Um, and so I'm going to try to streamline this pretty quickly and not read word for word. Um, but really, the, these two objectives focused on unsheltered people have to do with uh, making sure we're addressing the health and safety needs of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness, both throughout this continued pandemic, but also recognizing that being unsheltered is always a health issue and is a public health issue. And we need to, to really uh, always be focused on these issues for people who are unsheltered. Um, and then focusing on improving access and addressing racial inequities within such access to essential state supported services, including through Medi-Cal and behavioral health care reforms. And here I wanna highlight that uh, you'll see references to equity related issues, um, repeatedly throughout the objectives and you'll see references to health and medical and behavioral health care repeatedly throughout the objectives and that really was intended to be clear that we don't have one objective focus on equity uh, but it's trying to deeply embed a focus on equity across the objectives and also that we don't have one strategy related to health and behavioral health but that we see the importance of healthcare resources and strategies throughout the response to homelessness so especially the health ones start to feel a little repetitive but it really was intended to be clear that it, the health resources aren't just about this element of the response, but are about everything we're doing addressing homelessness. And then also just a reminder that the work of housing people out of unsheltered homelessness really rests in the housing action area. So you don't see that captured in these objectives, but that's a primary objective of this work. Next slide, please. So then focusing on shelter. Here we're focusing on implementing innovative approaches and expanding the supply of safe and housing placement focused sheltering and interim housing models, um, both for COVID-19 and while people are experiencing that pandemic, but also for the future so that we have a more effective system um, for providing shelter and models of shelter that are more welcoming and, uh, and seen as real opportunities for people. And then the fourth objective focuses on expanding alignment and engagement of state resources, again, including Medi-Cal and behavioral health to address health disparities and the service needs of people who are temporarily staying within these settings. Um, and again, the work of housing people out of shelter comes in the very next action area. So next slide, please. We have three objectives in the housing action area. The first focuses on mobilizing state resources, TA and guidance, again, kind of that full range of tools in the toolkits to continue to strengthen implementation of housing first approaches and other best practices. Uh, the secretary spoke of the importance of staying focused on these best practices earlier and it, doing that in support of equitably and urgently rehousing people from any experience of homelessness, including people who are in Project Room Key, people who are staying in other temporary settings and also from unsheltered homelessness. I'm um, reflecting on the earlier conversation. I think this is one of the areas in which um, addressing issues of coordinated entry. There might be strategies and activities related to that because we can't equitably and urgently rehouse people unless we are sure that the coordinated assessment and entry processes are equitable. Next slide, please. Uh, so here we focus on fostering the creation and expand the supply of affordable and supportive housing opportunities paired with health and behavioral health resources um, and making sure that those Opportunities are truly accessible and culturally responsive to people exiting homelessness, targeted to people at the lowest income levels and to people from historically marginalized communities, uh, representing all of the, the populations who are disproportionately impacted by risks and experiences of homelessness. And then the seventh objective focuses on short and longer term forms of rental assistance, both to directly support exits from homelessness, but also to support housing development activities 
and noting that there's need to innovate around those models and approaches. Um, here, I think the language here is um, is couched in certain ways because the coordinating financing council doesn't really have funding, doesn't really make funding decisions for the state. You can't make commitments on behalf of the governor or the legislature. But there again, there's a variety of tools and in, in the toolbox that can help support the creation of these expand the supply of housing opportunities or improve access to short and rent, short and long-term forms of rental assistance. So there's lots of tools that could be deployed and then other actors can maybe align strategies and in, in alignment with these objectives. Next slide, please. So we focus on diversion and prevention. Here we really wanna zero in on the role of many different systems in supporting um, identification of of households are experiencing housing crises or instability, um, both while they're receiving services, but also as they're exiting services and systems. Make sure we're really thoughtful about addressing racial inequities within the risks of experiencing homelessness within these systems, because the, the, the racial inequities we see in the population experiencing homelessness are really the direct result in many ways of inequities within these other systems and inequitable outcomes and inequitable risks created by these systems. Um, and have identified for initial focus, re-entry issues, um, youth and young adults connected to child welfare or juvenile justice systems, and people exiting healthcare settings and programs. Um, so that's the work really of making sure that housing crises are less likely to occur and people are less likely to, to face the risk of homelessness. And then the ninth objective focuses on responding when those crises do occur with targeted homelessness prevention interventions and uh, successful diversion strategies. Next slide, please. So the fifth action area is again on strengthening systems for the future. Um, many of these objectives really are intended to underpin all of the work and be relevant for all of the decision making um, relevant to the other objectives. Um, we have received some feedback already that um, in the current structure, some of these feel a little buried towards the end of the list of objectives. Uh, so that's definitely something that as we move forward, we can think through. Um, again, for today's conversation, I probably would worry less about the order in which the objectives are currently listed, but whether they're capturing the full range of activities um, that need to be identified. Um, but so the, and these two, I think especially are intended to be overarching and, and underpinning objectives, um, but they may be feeling like they're coming a little late in the list. Um, so number 10 focuses on strengthening racial equity focuses responses strategies and activities for organizations receiving funding from the state. Here again, I think is an area or an opportunity to focus on coordinated entry and coordinated assessment, and this be a part of the, the strengthening of the work is strengthening those elements of the response. Um, and number 11 focuses on ensuring that state and local planning and decision-making processes are deeply informed and guided by recommendations from people with lived expertise. We heard about the importance of that in their earlier presentations. And again, these are intended to be things that would help inform the work across all of the objectives. Next slide, please. The uh, 12th objective uh, focuses on interjurisdictional and regional planning and decision-making and finding ways to support that regional planning and develop mechanisms for accountability um, and develop capacity for such coordination through what might include mapping activities. Um, a lot of you spoke um, of the role that state agencies could play in mapping existing resources and identifying capacity gaps. Could include supporting local gaps analyses to help inform regional decision-making um, and further analysis of data and, and capacities. And 13th objective focuses on partnerships between homelessness services system and workforce development systems. To make sure as people are experiencing or exiting homelessness, they have access to employment services and employment opportunities. And that is a significant part of ensuring the success of uh, housing interventions. Next slide, please. And we're getting to the end here. So the 14th objective focuses on uh, supporting communities to develop disaster preparedness plans that are more inclusive of the needs of people experiencing homelessness so that we're responding to crises with and preparedness and the immediate response with the, the special considerations for people experiencing homelessness from the very beginning rather than scrambling to figure out how to do that work better in the midst of the crisis. And then the 15th objective focuses on state communication efforts to create broader public awareness of the homelessness strategies underway, successes, challenges, the importance of housing first, 
Um, we have already heard from multiple community representatives that this kind of bigger voice for the state could be really helpful in supporting local efforts and activities, both in avoiding duplication of effort across the state, but also having an external voice helping to inform local conversations. So those are the 15 objectives that um, have been drafted based upon the conversations with all of you, the last meeting, the initial external stakeholder conversations we've had to date. Um, again, as Ali mentioned, we'll be doing more of the external stakeholder conversations. We do have more work to do to make sure we've heard from enough people with left expertise as we move forward. And so there's some planning underway to coordinate more of those sessions. Um, but now I'm going to turn it back to the folks in the room to facilitate dialogue and discussion about this. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, and thank you, Ali. Um, so we are going to just um, uh, open it up for council member um, comments and discussion um, before we open it up to the public. And so council members, if you have any questions or comments, uh, I see uh, council member Ketchuside. Um Yes, go ahead. So at some point, are we going to be able to address subpopulations, specifically youth, um, especially with the SB 918 requirements? Um, and have we talked to stakeholders that are youth providers, um, like CCY or any of the others that are even based in the Sacramento area? Um, just to make sure that we're breaking out these populations and really looking at the individual needs, specifically youth, because their needs um, are so different. Yep, I can jump in on that, and because that was supposed to be part of my framing comments, and I forgot, so I apologize. But as we as we build up the strategies and activities, we would be very consciously thinking about are there youth specific strategies, family with children specific strategies, veteran specific strategies. So definitely making sure we're thinking about how how would these objectives uh, apply to different subpopulations? What's the strategic work that would advance these objectives on behalf of different subpopulations? And then we do have uh, plans for more conversations, including with some of the organizations you mentioned that we have not been able to coordinate in this time frame yet, but we will be hearing from more stakeholders around specific subpopulations. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you flagging that because I was supposed to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, any other questions or comments? Yes, Council Member Gilman. Um, hi, this is, well, a couple of things, a couple of reflections I wanted to share. I wanted to say, I think this is a great start for these broad buckets and I'm really eager to see how we're gonna then break them down into action. Um, I also would hope that when we're thinking about subpopulations, sort of a non-traditional subpopulation, I think in some ways, again, has been um, not to be on my soapbox, an unintended consequence of coordinated entry, are individuals, families, young adults, et cetera, who are all um, more recently homeless. Um, problem solving only goes so far. And I think that if we wanted to look at how do we rapidly rehouse individuals who, you know, I'm just illustrating an example, who've been homeless for 12, you know, less than, you know, 15 months, um, in a much more traditional rental subsidy way um, or voucher utilization through a housing authority system in the state. I, I just don't want to lose track of that population, which when you look at pointing time counts across the state has, is, has been increasing year over year. Um, I think we, we get stuck sometimes just focusing on chronic homelessness. So that was just one reflection. And then I would also hope to, in the framing, to open up the document. And I know we haven't really discussed this, so this could maybe be at our next council meeting. I hope we would be bold, ambitious, and innovative. And, and I'm not sure, and I, I look um, to, um, to um, Deputy Secretary Sutton, if we have the ability to do this, I'd love to see us actually start with a bold goal. You know, again, illustrated that by 2030, we're going to reduce homelessness across the state of California by 75%. And I'm just throwing that out there, um, again, as an illustrative example, because I do think we need to hold ourselves accountable at the state level, and that gives us then the leverage to hold the COCs and the counties accountable through some of the mechanisms that you know that we you know and some of the levers that we do have. So I I didn't know quantitative reductions either at the population level or broader were going to be part of the plan, but I wanted to put a plug that I th I think that should be part of the framing document um, that we're sort of driving to in during this two year process. 
Good. Thank you. you Want to respond? Yeah, I mean, I can I can sort of respond, Gail. I think that it, it would be um, a good conversation for for us as we move into the December meeting and thinking about how we're framing some of it. I think the challenge we've had, and we've even had some of these conversations with our legislative stakeholders recently, is that we're trying to make this actionable, and it's hard to figure out how to make it actionable and aspirational, not knowing sort of budgetary conversations, not knowing what might change with legislative impacts. And so I think we're trying to, to, to balance that out a little bit. And so just figuring out how we do that while still keeping it in this really intentional, actionable two-year model. Um, but, I, but I understand that the, the framing piece of this as we think about how it actually is packaged together, perhaps there's something there that we can do that, that signals the fact that we want this to to have a longer term impact and this is just our first two year mm -hmm. bite at the apple so to speak yeah and um Ali, i think it would even be what our north star is you know mm -hmm. uh, you know really like the fact it's going to be so actionable and we can hold ourselves accountable and hopefully the public um the governor's office and the legislature will hold us accountable as well and then that trickles down but it was i was just throwing it out there to have sort of more aspirational north stars of what we believe as a council and as a state um we want to achieve around the over 150,000 um Californians who on you know a nightly basis are experiencing homelessness throughout the state yeah absolutely it's a really good point thanks I think Corinne might have had her hand up too I'm not sure yeah Corinne I guess <laughs> council member Buchanan yeah Thanks so much. So um, thank you, Matthew, for walking us through this so, um, uh, so in such a clear way. And I agree also that the, the layout is really helpful, I think, to digest the information. And you've done such a great job synthesizing so many. I know there were many, many conversations that went into this document. Um, the, the, um, during the conversation around some populations, it also just made me think about um, the all of the different partnerships um, and collaborations that will likely be needed to be successful in this work and really lifting up work. I'm, I'm thinking in particular about um, work uh, with our criminal justice partners at the state level um, and we, we could be with our workforce partners, um, just the ways in which um, we as a council can work with um, especially other state agencies to really move the needle. So just wanted to lift up that, that desire to see that included as well. And, you know, I wanted to um, th thank you for that comment. I also wanted to sort of build um, on um, the comment that was made by Tamika uh, Moss um, as she was presenting, um, and it goes to item number, well, actually, I guess, objective number 13, that we need to enhance partnerships between homelessness service systems and workforce development. The way she couched it, though, was very different. It was not just about sort of workforce development and employment, but it was about asset building and wealth building, which is, I think, very different. Mm -hmm. and, and it goes to this point of being aspirational. So it's not just like connecting somebody to a job. It is, you know, how are we sort of uh, creating those, you know, kind of pathways to build on uh, the assets that individuals bring are bringing, but also how are we connecting and setting up individuals or families or households to kind of be on this wealth building pathway right and it it's that is bold right that is different um that that's and, and so i i would ask that maybe we reframe number 13 to capture that more kind of aspiration of focus that it's it's more than just workforce development it is you know asset building and, and wealth building which then I think will drive a different set of strategies and different set of actions mm -hmm. and a different group of stakeholders that uh, or partners that be, need to be engaged. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Matthew, I don't yeah. know. If you, yeah. Yeah, I think you could reframe and then the employment focus might actually be more of a strategy object activity under yeah. a mm -hmm. well, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councilmember Caviar. Oh, I think Don, you might be on mute. There we go. There we go. 
sorry, I just wanted to um, commend the staff for um, putting together such a comprehensive and broad, diverse uh, set of planning objectives. And um, they cover a lot of territory. And as an over, as so the overarching objectives, um, I, I think that um, since they're going to guide the more detailed planning process, um, it's kind of understandable that they lack a certain, a certain level of detail regarding the measurable outcomes the council is going to want to likely achieve from these efforts. So my comment is simply that whatever objectives we end up agreeing to, that um, staff should also be tasked with identifying the objective measures by which we're going to evaluate our success. Mm -hmm. And then sort of the frequency at which point we're going to report that out. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd like to know if my fellow council members would like it as well, but I was sort of thinking that it might be helpful as we go forward if, to the extent possible, um, the council or the staff could report back on the outcomes of the funding that we previously deployed from the council, and specifically, how was it used and what strategies were the most impactful in dealing with homelessness, you know, what worked and what didn't. And I think that that would be helpful in sort of shaping our discussions going forward. So that's my comment. Yeah, and I would just say um, we'll give a little bit, not not quite to the level of detail you just you just mentioned, but we'll give a little bit of that if we get to our departmental update today. Um, we'll give a little bit out on that on our on our end. I, I think I I will just say, and one of the things that is challenging just in the way that we are framed and, and situated as a council is that. Um, we want to think of our funding that the council is set to distribute in the same way we want to think about the funding that CDSS has to distribute, that the same that HCD has to distribute, sort of try to think about all of the funding sources that the state, all of us sit at the table, uh, you all sit on, on the table in different seats at the council because each of you provides some level of resource or funding to the, the, the puzzle um, at the state level. And so really trying to make sure it's not just what we're learning from the funding coming out of HCFC, but also what we're learning out of ESG at HCD and from the programs of CDSS and from Cal OES and, and others at the table that you all bring your own um, information and best practices sharing and what's working and what's not as well. And so just want to broaden the umbrella a little bit to make sure we're covering all of the learning across the, the state, not just from the funding that we, we distribute within council staff. I would just say uh, uh, also um, to, on the, the point of the importance of um, measurable outcomes and then also having uh, a schedule or a timeline for reporting back. I definitely agree with you. I, I mean, I think that this is the way that we will track our progress and then also kind of, you know, course adjust um, and uh, not only sort of report out through our meetings, but at some point be able to be, to have like a, a, a public, um, a more public sort of uh, scorecard or public, you know, kind of performance, um, it, it be able to, you know, to, to share more broadly, right, the, the work of HCFC. And so um, my understanding in terms of how we're going through this process is once we've established the, you know, and the council agrees with these being the 15 objectives, the next step is to begin to build in the detail um, to be more precise in terms of the, the uh, strategies and then how we're going to measure those strategies and then to come back with a, a reporting kind of um, schedule to present to the council and then we can kind of uh, adjust from there. So, you know, I, I appreciate you bringing it up because I think that is definitely part of the next phase uh, once the council um, feels that this is the right framework for us to move with. We didn't want to get too deep in the details if you all thought that we were missing something or that you know it was not the right framework. Yeah, and I would just I would add to that too. In the conversations we had with you all each individually at the state agency side, you may recall that we said um, we're going to be coming back to you all with your action items to put into this, so that it is not just the staff suggesting what you all should be doing or what the staff at HCFC should be doing, but that all of us collectively have skin in the game. Um, so to speak, <laughs> and and that that we will be tracking as a collective, all of the different council members who represent state departments will have something to report back on in these council meetings. That the staff is sort of the facilitator for those conversations. That we're the nudger, we're the pusher, we're the hey, how's that going? Can we provide any additional support? 
but that there's some pieces of this the staff will be doing and there's some pieces of this that the state agencies and departments will be coming to the table recommending that either that they've already started doing and so we want to capture that information right we want to know the great work we're already doing and how that's moving us towards these objectives and also taking a look at what else we need to be doing more of collectively across the state agencies and departments not just within hcsc staff so so you may recall that little nugget and so it's great to hear the interest in that because that is our next step <laughs> and i just matthew i would just flag that as we think about measures especially on a relatively short time horizon for this action plan uh, we likely will have some process measures of did we were we able to do what we committed to do and we did we do it well we we'll likely have some that are just output measures given what can be accomplished but measuring kind of the volume of activity and the number of people who might be impacted and then probably a smaller number to be honest of outcome measures of uh, given just the time frame and the ability to control some of the the final outcomes at the local level but i so i think we just need to be ready that the measurement system will likely be there process measures, output measures, and outcome measures. All right, thank you. Any other comments from council members? And if they're not, um, we can maybe go to public uh, comment and, uh, to hear from the public. Okay, I don't see anyone raising their hands, so I think, um, oh, do we? Who is that? Uh, looks like we uh, have some public comment hands raised. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. All right. Um, council members, we're going to go to the uh, public uh, comment portion on, on the agenda and uh, turn it over to Evan to help us facilitate this. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, so, uh, if you wish to make a public comment after a member of the public, uh, please look at the raised hand icon. Uh, you'll use that to indicate that you wish to make a comment. And then I'll unmute uh, your line. I'll mention your name so you know who you are. Uh, and um, you will have three minutes to make your comment. So it looks like first we have Christine Smith. Christine, your line is open. Terrific. Um, my name is Christine Smith. I'm with the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence, and we have several um, members on the call today from our Policy Advisory Council. So we did want to just kind of emphasize that as you're thinking about populations to include in this plan and at, in your work going forward, um, that home, you know, the population of domestic violence survivors that are considered homeless under the federal definition, but that 57% of homeless women experience or report domestic violence as an immediate cause of their homelessness. Uh, 18,000 women or 18,000 domestic violence survivors stayed in shelters last year. So we do want to make sure that we're highlighting that population and encourage you to consider them for funding, but also for your long term plan. Yeah, thank you for that. And Christine, I don't know if, um, Gina, if you want to mention, I know we talked a little bit about that in, in our one-on-ones, but that is definitely on our on our radar and is on our list. Gina gave us some great contacts to, to reach out to in our external stakeholder conversation. Thanks. Um, I'd encourage you to reach out to us at the California Partnership to End Domestic Violence. I don't, you have my information from the registration, but we also have a great um, policy advisory council who's on the call as well. Um, so I encourage um, them to do public comment as well, or um, you can reach out to us and we can connect you to local programs also. So thank you so much. I think you actually are already on our list as an organization. <laughs> appreciate you being on the call. We'd love to have a further conversation. Yep. All right, looks like next we have a comment from Kimberly Lewis. Now, hi, good afternoon. This is Kimberly Lewis. I'm with the California Coalition for the Year. I appreciate the comments raised by council member Debbie Ketchestine around you and Matthew's clarification that you will be spending some time and attention to the need to be experiencing homelessness. Um, we look forward to being and supporting your work on that. Um, I did also want to reference, you know, as you're talking about workforce development, um, that you think about, you know, independence and creating self-sufficiency, and that should be really highlighted in terms of some of the goals that you're doing in your action plan. Um, and then additionally, my assumption would be that as you're talking about medical and behavioral health care activities that that's inclusive of substance abuse services um, and dual diagnoses. So we just you know elevate a couple of those immediate points from looking at this document in the presentation today and again look forward to continuing the conversation with you as we move forward. Great, thank you.
I'm not seeing any other public comments, any other raised hands. Looks like we have no further public comments. Give it another 30 seconds and see if anyone else wants to chime in. I don't see any additional comments. Okay. All right, no additional comments. Um, and so th thank you for those of you that are um, with us today uh, from the public and you know, for those of you that provided um, input, we very much appreciate it. And of course we will be following up. Um, so now I'll turn it back to the council members to see if you have any final comments or questions or remarks. Yes, council member Anderson. Yeah, I too just want to thank the staff and, and Matthew for their great work um, uh, on this project and synthesizing a lot of information and just share that I'm, you know, really excited to, um, you know, on the progress on this and this document and to have a, it'll be great to have an acumen plan and this defined direction for the council. So thanks for the continued great work. Thank you, council member. Would you like to make a motion? <laughs> Since I don't see any other comments, do we have anyone else that wants to comment before we entertain the motion? Sure. What, what's what's the motion to? Uh, the, the motion would be to approve the action plan objectives as uh, outlined, of course, with the modification to item number thirteen. So moved. Okay. Second. It's been moved and second. I think uh, uh, Gustavo. Yes. Yeah. Council Member Velasquez, second. All right. All right. Any? Do we? No more discussion, right? We've already had the discussion, so we can go into roll call. Mm -hmm. Evan. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Council Chair Lourdes Castro Ramirez. Enthusiastically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Council Vice Chair Emilio Ramirez. Yes. Council Member Amy Anderson. Yes. Council Member Russell Atterbury. Yes. Council Member Alexis Berries. Uh, looks, like, looks like Alexis may have dropped off at some point. All right, Council Member Gina Bucchieri Harrington. Yes. Council Member Corinne Buchanan. Yes. Council Member Donald Tevier? Yes. Council Member J.C. Cooper? Yes. Council Member Gail Gilman? Hello. Yes. Council Member Jody Ketchaside? Yes. Council Member Jennifer Loving? Yes. Council Member Gary McCoy? Yes. Council Member Tokes Omashakin? I could attend it. Tokes, you might be muted or frozen. Stokes? Let me come back to him. All right. Council Member Joe Ukashiba? Yes. Council Member Gustavo Velasquez? Yes. Huh? And yeah. Uh, Council Member Tokes on the <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Visual, yes. <laughs> okay. All right. We have uh, uh, unanimous approval. approval. Yeah. All right. We have unanimous approval. Thank you all very much. Um, and again, thank you, Matthew and Ali, for leading this um, process. So stay tuned for more. Um, we will you know, definitely agendize this item um, during our next uh, meeting for additional updates on the performance um, and measurable outcomes. 
Okay, moving on to the next item on the agenda, item number six. Uh, this is uh, an informational item where uh, departments and uh, HCFC council members you know, have an opportunity to provide updates on the work that is underway. Uh, I will go ahead and turn this over to uh, Deputy Secretary Ali Sutton, and uh, she will start with a report from HCFC and then introduce each of the departments uh, to provide individual updates. Thank you. Great, thank you, Secretary. And and just uh, uh, before I dive into sort of the work of HCFC, I want to thank everybody that provided written updates um, to to our team in advance. Um, as you see, we're starting to really build out these agendas and, and have quite a lot to discuss in them. And so our time for departmental updates, unfortunately, is likely going to get get cut shorter uh, as we as we move forward with some of our, our actionable work. And so um, we will be asking more of you to, to do those updates and then really just bring the highlights up here to make sure that everybody is able to understand the, the big ticket items you all have been working on in between the, the different areas. So just a thanks in advance. I know that is a bit of additional work, but allows us to really stay focused on, on some of the broader uh, connection conversations to, to happen in, inside these meetings. Um, so with that, I will try to keep ours as brief as possible. Um, so the secretary mentioned HDIS, um, our homeless data integration system. We are in the midst of contract negotiations and are so uh, so close to, to being able to start um, our, our build out. So more to come on, on that here very soon, um, but, but um, more we'll be, we'll be working on, on developing that system here starting in November and, and moving through February. So we'll have a, a more robust update for you all uh, at the December meeting most likely. But just a thanks to all of the 44 COCs who have all signed data use agreements and we're in, in midst of conversation with them on, on submitting all of that data into the system as we start to build it out. Um, just a quick on sort of what it is and what it isn't that I think will be helpful as folks start to talk more about um, the system as a whole. Um, so just wanna make sure our council members really understand and, and members of public listening in understand what we expect this system to do and what it will not be, at least at the beginning. Um, so this is going to be the largest warehouse, um, sort of data warehouse, of, of individuals in a de-identified way um, of folks experiencing homelessness across the state. Um, it is going to be a repository of longitudinal data across all 44 continuums of care. Um, so really taking all 44 COCs data over a longitudinal period, um, doing data, doing intense data matching, and sort of really being able to get to a um, a, a, a warehouse of folks that are unduplicated, um, sort of an unduplicated count of individuals experiencing homelessness or being served by um, our, our systems across the state. So just a, a quick clarification on what it is. Um, it will have lots of different abilities. There's a ton of policy questions that this will be able to help us answer and better understand how to move forward on practice. Um, it is not, though, a comprehensive count of people experiencing homelessness across the state. I will say that again, it is not a comprehensive count of people experiencing homelessness across the state. This is just the folks who are entered into HMIS systems across the state who have been reached out to or provided services by um, our continuums of care. And so th this will by nature be an undercount of who is experiencing homelessness across the state because it will not reach everybody if they have not actually come into contact and received services and been entered into an HMIS system. So just a quick clarification on that. You all are going to be our ambassadors for this as this is released, and so just want to make sure everyone understands and, and can speak from the same sheet of music about, or sing from the same sheet of music about what it is, and it's not. It is also not going to be a case management system. And so this is not something we expect to have live time, um, sort of folks being able to enter and access as a case management tool. It is much, it's a bit higher level than that to sort of understand at a de-identified level trends and what is happening with our, our population and who is, who is being served at any given point. So just a little bit, there'll be much more to come. Um, we'll have much more to share with you all as we actually get the vendor on board and start to build. But as we start to, to talk more about it, just thought it might be helpful for a little bit of framing on, on where it's moving. Um, a couple other things just real quickly. As the secretary mentioned, we are working very, very uh, hard on the HAP Round 2 application. Um, we are expecting that out here in the next couple of weeks prior to our November 30th um, statutory deadline. Um, applicants, just a little bit, applicants will have 60 days to, to submit. We then have up to 60 days to review. Um, this is a little bit different than half round one in that if applications are not submitted completely, 
um, we have the ability to go back and ask for additional information from applicants and, and receive that information before we approve the, the total application. So there, there may be some back and forth with grantees in a way that we didn't have in the first round. Um, they're also given some, some statutory amendments um, into this round of funding. The application itself will look a little different. Um, uh, you will see some nice coordination and alignment uh, um, with other applications that have come across the state. So really trying to make sure that we are asking similar questions to things that we have asked in the past that HCFC or that HCD has asked in their ESG application um, and what CDSS has asked in some of their applications. So really trying to make this, while it is not one large application across the state, really trying to make sure that we're we're trying to ask similar questions for grantees to make it an easier process for them to apply for state funding. Um, so some of those things we will be asking um, a bit similar questions to what ESG asks, and we will also be asking some racial equity questions because that is embedded into the statute this year. So really looking forward to, to having some of those dialogues with communities as that gets released. Um, other things just quickly, and I'll go very fast on these, more to come maybe later, but a little bit on heap and hap since it's been a while in terms of expenditures. Um, so we have data through June 30th, so we're a little bit delayed as you can expect um, from getting getting uh, reports back from our grantees and, and sort of having them be able to invoice appropriately. But as of June 30th, our HEAP um, was 92% obligated. So that 500 million was 92% obligated and 47% spent, um, which quarterly spending shows us in a pretty good spot across the state to fully spend down that funding um, by June 30th of, of this coming year. Um, and HAP, we were really excited to see. I think we've we, lessons learned from HEAP and local communities about how to, to move this funding more quickly. HAP, uh, you might remember, we just dispersed funding in May and June. Um, and so through June 30th, 35% was already obligated and 3% was already expended. Not surprising, most of that funding has gone towards um, new sort of emergency sheltering, non-congregate sheltering sorts of, of things, uh, given that this funding hit right in the beginning of, of some of our COVID response efforts. So more to come on that as we get going, but very happy to see communities sort of moving those, those balls forward and, and seeing a lot of sort of um, flexibility and need for strategic thinking about how to use this funding in relation to other new funding that has come down from the federal government. So just a bit on that. And then the last thing I will mention um, just to stay in, 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 in line with our timing, um, you know, and, and I imagine uh, CDSS or HCD may speak a little to this, but we have been really having coordinated conversations about how to ensure folks that are currently in Project Room Key uh, sites have permanent housing exits. And so one of the things we're working on in coordination with our partners right now um, is trying to put out some additional guidance, sort of following up from our strategic spending guide we put out in July very targeted towards um, project room key exits, how to use the funding they have to make sure that's happening, best practices that we've learned around rehousing efforts out of room key from the 100 day challenge and other things like that, but very much trying to make it a clear and urgent priority of the state to make sure that the folks that are currently living in those sites um, are not returning to unsheltered homelessness. So more to come on that, but some exciting guidance that will be coming out around that to just help communities uh, think about how to scale quickly. Um, so with that, I am going to go through our, our list here real quickly of departments. So um, maybe just, I, I have on my list starting with JC at DHCS. I think you provided a written update and so folks should have that. Um, but anything you'd want to add to that or highlight from that, now is your, your time. Um, no, to respect the, the time of others, um, I have my written uh, response and I'm happy to engage with anyone outside of the council uh, meeting if they have additional questions. Okay, great, thank you. Um, HCD, Gustavo, you also had a written update, but anything you'd want to highlight there? Um... Just very quickly, I mean, home key, as you may have probably seen every week, the governor has been talking about this groundbreaking initiative, uh, an innovative program, as you I'm sure are familiar with, to purchase and rehabilitate hotels, motels, vacant apartment buildings and other properties and convert them into permanent long-term housing for people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, so far, uh, as I uh, pointed out in the report, uh, we've announced, well, the governor has announced 
personally six rounds of awards. Um, this is uh, over $700 million to exactly 78 projects. And when uh, all of this is done, we'll have more than 5,000, close to 5,100 permanent housing units in communities throughout California. Uh, this um, federal uh, CRF dollars have been complemented by 45 million in, phil in philanthropic funding, 20 million from Blue Shield of California and 25 million from, from Kaiser to support um, operating subsidies for home key projects. So uh, meeting, as you know, an expedited deadline set by uh, CRF uh, uh, expenditures by the end of the calendar year. So we are working around the clock to execute the standard agreements that will make these acquisitions, actual acquisitions, uh, fully uh, completed, um, equip our list to, to implement the home key projects. Uh, additionally, just to wrap up, uh, October 7, this past October 7, the Joint Legislative Budget Committee approved the governor's request for an additional $200 million in, in CRF funding to continue to provide home key support uh, to communities with ready for conversion projects. So this will allow us, you know, there's a lot of projects on the wait list really allow us to continue to fund into the wait list, which is uh, very good news. Uh, again, we have a very tight deadline, right? So trying to complete all of this by the end of the calendar year but so far it's moving um it's moving the, the initiative is moving quite well and um and you know other updates are on the on the uh, report uh including uh i don't know if we included information on the cares act but uh we are obviously also moving um dollars uh into communities as part of uh esg CARES Act, uh, round one and round two. So that's all I have. Great, thank you very much. Um, Cal HFA, Don? Yeah, uh, we have a detailed report included in the package, but by way of a brief update, um, the agency has a, a special needs housing program, which is a loan program targeted at financing the development of permanent supportive housing units for individuals with serious mental issues uh, who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And uh, HCD's No Place Like Home program that was approved uh, for funding in 2016 um, replaced that program. So we've been um, in wind down mode ever since. And uh, by way of update, there's a table in your package that um, lists the, the counties as well as the 55 projects that we're working through our pipeline. Um, those projects are all scheduled um, to close construction by June of 2022. Um, to date, we've closed four projects um, for about 305 units. We have 25 that have closed construction for about 1,658 units, and we have an active uh, sort of in process. They're still um, working through the final approvals for another 26 projects for 1,602 units. So at the conclusion of the program in December 15, 2023, we expect to have about 3,565 units of deeply targeted affordable housing for some of our most vulnerable uh, population completed. So that's where we are at this point. Great, thank you very much. Um, Cal OES, Tina, anything you'd wanna to add to your written report? No, I think we capitalized everything on that, still working on COVID, as you all know, and mm -hmm. fires and uh, public safety shutdowns right now. So we're in full swing. And have been for months. So. Yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. CDSS, Karen, anything you'd wanna add to what was submitted? Yeah, sure, I'll just highlight a couple of things. Thanks everyone, Karen Buchanan, the Calgary Department of Social Services. So um, the first is that we are continuing to provide COVID specific guidance to our existing grantees as they um, respond to the unique needs um, of, our, of our population. Um, also just a quick update on Project Room Key, which I think folks may know is our 
state supported but locally um, administered effort to provide non congregate shelter in hotels, motels, and trailers for people experiencing homelessness in response to COVID 19. Um, most recently, FEMA. Um, again, extended our um, uh, approval for 75% federal cost share. They did that through October 30th. They, they continue to give us um, extensions of just 30 days um, every single month um, since we've started this pandemic. So we, of course, have asked again for um, another extension and we expect to hear very soon on that. Um, and we'll continue to make those requests for the duration of the pandemic. Um, we, as a reminder, um, have uh, set an ambitious goal of 15,000, securing 15,000 units across the state um, and uh, succeeded in exceeding that goal um, by uh, securing over 16,000 hotel rooms to support this effort. As Ali mentioned, we've been um, very, uh, across the, the um, state family, um, we've been really focused on supporting communities uh, to on their rehousing efforts out of Project Room Key. Um, and uh, some communities, in fact, are um, not all, but some communities are winding down some of their room key sites in order to really deeply invest in those rehousing strategies. Just a couple of quick updates um, on our on additional programming, including our CalWORKs housing support program. Um, we will be very soon um, releasing our uh, allocation of, 15, of $95 million in funding for the housing support program, um, which uh, as you probably, some, some folks know, um, is a rapid rehousing intervention for people who are on CalWORKs, families who are on CalWORKs. I want to lift up um, one important um, bill that was signed into law this year that specifically focuses on our CalWORKs Homeless Assistance Program, um, and that is Senate Bill uh, 1065, um, which makes some changes to the program, a number of changes, about 10 changes, but most notably, it removes the $100 asset limit for families to receive um, or become eligible for the homeless assistance benefit, which um, we think helps really just remove an unnecessary barrier to access to these really important housing resources for low income families. Um, and then um, lastly, we'll lift up that our housing and disability advocacy program, and this is our very flexible program to provide um, outreach, housing supports, case management, as well as um, uh, benefits advocacy. Um, for individuals with disabilities across the state. Um, we'll be releasing uh, $25 million in state funding uh, in the very near term for that program as well for the coming fiscal year. So I can look out for that. And that's all I've got. Great, thank you. Um, Caltrans, folks, anything you'd like to add in relation to what you provided? Sure. Uh, I have a detailed report, uh, as everybody else has done as well. I'll, I'll just note two very quick things. Uh, since March of this year, we've uh, pretty much stopped and slowed down all the regular encampment removals uh, based on the CDC guidelines. Uh, and for comparison's sakes, how much we've slowed down between March and October uh, of 2019, uh, we cleared 4,000 encampments across the state. Uh, and between March and October of 2020, we cleared 40 encampments. So from 4,000 to 40 uh, in, in the same six month span uh, of comparison. So we've completely sl slowed down. And in the meantime, over the last two months, one key thing that we've been, uh, we've been working on is we're developing a prioritization system, a risk-based prioritization system uh, to look at the not only the, the safety implications on people at encampment sites and people using the transportation system, but also on our infrastructure. So from a scale of one to five, one being, you know, very dangerous, eminently dangerous to people nearby, to five, uh, not you know, not too bad a condition. We're coming up with a system to say, here's how we're going to determine what encampments need to be moved and moved uh, as soon as possible. So in the meantime, it's that risk-based system that we're working on. We're working on it with members of the HCFC, uh, health, uh, HHS, OES, CHP, uh, all very involved in that, in that prioritization system. So those two quick points are, uh, are very important to know. Uh, thank you. 
Great, thank you very much. And then Calvet Ref, did you have anything you wanted to? Nothing to report, I see you nodding your head. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> right, I'm trying to get to the mute button. Uh, no, nothing else there. Thank Great. you. Great, thank you. And then just a, a, a heads up, I, um, we're, we are still trying to fill a couple of our state agency seats. And so you'll see, despite not having a, um, somebody from CDE sitting on our council to date, we do have staff members over there that we asked to provide a bit of an update on what they're up to. We'll try to, we're, we're working very hard to fill seats um, on the council, but in the interim, we figured this is a really important way for all of us to be able to understand what's happening in those areas. So we'll keep trying to do that um, as, as, as there are seats vacant. Um, moving forward. So with that, I think we're we're done with departmental updates. Great, thank you. I'll just you know take maybe just a, a moment to uh, to share um, uh, as part of agency, um, DCSH um, has been taking the lead uh, with um, uh, ensuring that that there is um, information and resources and proper understanding of the protections under a bill that was signed into law by Governor Newsom. Um, AB 3088, uh, which is um, focused on preventing evictions um, of uh, tenants that are experiencing financial hardship uh, due to COVID-19, uh, and also delays, um, you know, landlord rental recovery and, until uh, after February 1st of 2021. Um, there has been a lot of effort across uh, agency and departments and many stakeholders involved in helping us uh, develop resources that are available at housing, housingiskey.com. Again, it's housing.key.com. Um, and so I invite you all, um, if you are working with um, community members that have been impacted um, and that need um, to access you know, resources, or understand the protections that are afforded under AB 3088, uh, you can go to uh, housingiskey.com um, to access uh, that information. Uh, also, um, when you visit housingiskey.com, you'll see, uh, you should see a link to a survey uh, that the agency has developed to help um, uh, obtain input from members, uh, from you know, diverse uh, stakeholders in terms of um, developing a, uh, a plan to help inform uh, how we intend to use future federal funding. Um, you know, we're very optimistic that at some point Congress is going to pass a relief package and we want to hear from you all in terms of how those dollars should be spent. Uh, we will also make sure that uh, that link gets posted on the HCFC website uh, and encourage you all to, to help us disseminate that information. So thank you. Uh, okay, and with that, I think we'll go on to uh, the last item on the agenda, item number seven. This is uh, public uh, comments on items that are not on the agenda. And so I think we'll start with, I'll turn it over to Evan to see if we have any member of the public that would like to address the council at this point on items that are not on the agenda. Sure, thank you. Any members of the public who wish to make a comment? Uh, Locate the raise hand icon in your meeting window. This would be the time to do so. Not seeing any raised hands, so I'll give it uh, a moment more. I am not seeing any raised hands. Okay, thank you, Evan. Again, you know, for those of you that have joined us for the council meeting, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your participation. Um, before we, of course, end uh, today's meeting, this is an opportunity for council members uh, to make suggestions on items for future council meetings. And so I invite you all, if you have any suggestions or uh, comments uh, for us to consider, this is the time to do so. Okay, 
I don't see any hands going up. I think that means uh, <laughs> there are no additional suggestions. So thank you very much. Uh, again, I just want to um, you know, acknowledge um, the great work that has been taking place uh, within the staff and you know, the, your efforts, your you know, departmental or agency efforts, and the work that you're doing in the community for those of you that are um, on the ground, uh, you know, working every single day to, to ensure uh, that individuals experiencing homelessness have prevention um, services, access to housing, and the proper support. Um, so thank you for all that you're doing. I think this uh, concludes our meeting, and we anticipate uh, reconvening in December, December, December the 18th, which happens to be my son's birthday. <laughs> Good reminder. Uh, uh, so thank you all very much for joining us. Uh, have a great week and uh, thanks for your uh, support on the action plan. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Bye everyone. <laughs>